Ranger here to talk about their their work uh, as uh, many things at Duke and the DCRI. You, you hear about the work when you're at national and international meetings. Uh, the news media uh, cover it broadly. I thought it would be nice to, to have it showcased appropriately uh, in our own back, backyard. And this is, this is work that has had a uh, huge impact, uh, work that I was aware of uh, long before coming to, to Duke, going back to the gusto and, and Tammy days that has been transformed, transformed into something that is, has changed practice at, at Duke nationally and internationally. So uh, well, well done. I'm looking forward to, to hearing about what you're up to now with, uh, with Race ER. Thank you, Rick, and thanks, Chris, for inviting me back over the street here, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, we've been working on this project for a while. It actually started with a fellow uh, in the DCRI, uh, but it goes back much further than that. Uh, and looking at the back of the room here, we have some Duke jerseys, and, and really uh, no presentation is complete without the inspiration from the great Coach K. And that's really what this is all about, is uh, working with our team and winning national championships despite you know, average talent. So this is right before I started the data bank, as it was called back then. Uh, this is a computer designed to replace nurses uh, in the intensive care unit. It didn't work. So three years later, in 69, this man, Dr. Stead, rolled down the hall to the cath lab and said he could replace doctors instead, and uh, started entering in data uh, into this computer, and I think Carrie may recognize this computer, of everyone's cath results and then calling them every year to see if they were still alive or not. And people in this building, it's the longest follow-up ever in, in, in heart disease. About in 1972, Dr. Lee was hired, I believe. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. They had all these data, and the problem was it was variable follow-up. And so how do you take this database with all these different lengths of follow-up and make any sense out of it? So he started applying something called a Cox proportional hazards model, which I think came from the Guinness Brewery looking at survival of, of beer in the bottles. I'm not sure how uh, uh, Dr. Lee, he's, he's from Utah originally, and how he knew about this Guinness beer uh, secrets, but that's how the, the Cox models came about, and, and probably everything we do in cardiology and observational research um, uh, actually started with, with Dr. Lee's work, and it's, it's amazing that he's here today and still, still with us. But really, when things got hopping for, for uh, Dr. Granger and myself and what, this project was something called the, the TAMI trials, the thrombolysis and acute myocardial infarction. And the history is there were two groups, the TAMI and Timmy. Timmy was up in the northeast part of the country, Baltimore, Boston, Boston, uh, and we had TAMI. And we had these three physicians. Uh, you all recognize uh, Rob Califf here uh, when he still had his mustache. Um, and two others, Harry Phillips, who was a fellow in an echo lab over, a dog lab over in the VA, whose job was to go give lectures. And he started talking about giving fibrinolysis. People started calling back to Duke and saying, I got this patient with a myocardial infarction. What do I do? Where's Dr. Phillips? And he's over in the VA in this dog lab. They finally promoted him. He came across. And the third person was Dr. Jess Peter, whose picture's not up here, who basically uh, taught himself to cath. After being a fellow at Duke and not being allowed to cath, he went to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, taught himself in the Navy, came back, and, and just around the clock was cathing these patients. So it was Rob Califf rounding every day in the CCU as he attending, Harry Phillips on the phone, and Jess Peter in the cath lab called PCP. And every single patient who came in was randomized into the TAMI trials. And they studied all types of things, uh, faster lytics, different kinds of lytics, had a, had a really large impact. It was really neat so when I started here. Uh, We'll get back to Gusto, but um, when I started here, we had patients coming from across the state, so from Galax, Virginia, from Wilmington. We had three helicopters going around the clock. We filled every single floor in the hospital. You got no sleep. We once turned a CCU room over five times in, in the same shift. Um, it was just hopping, and the weather wouldn't help you. When it was raining or snowing, they could fly six wings into the airport, and we were just hopping. And everyone got three casts, actually. 60, 90 minutes, and then before they left the hospital, and then at six months. We got paid for all three catheterizations. So you can imagine things are really, really doing well um, at Duke. It was a lot of fun. And we were, um, I think at the time, says us, Mayo, and, and uh, maybe Cleveland Clinic or Hopkins were the, uh, considered the, the premier cardiology sites in the country. And during this time, Rob and his colleagues made this leap from the TAMI group 
to this crazy thing called Gusto, which to me sounds like a beer commercial. I was at the fir first Gusto meeting. It was in the Washington Duke. I, maybe, I don't know if, Carrie, you were there or not. Um, we we're talking about uh, th this trial. And the idea was that Eric Topol, Rob's good friend and partner in the Tammy Group, had another colleague who had uh, developed TPA. And TPA had just been shown to be uh, no better than streptokinase in a European trial. And because it was 10 times the cost, TPA was going to go away. So Dr. Caleb and colleagues, and I'm going to Carrie came up with the power calculation here, a 40,000 patient trial in multiple continents to look at TPA versus streptokinase. And TPA given properly with proper heparin dosing. And this really was transformative, I think, for, for this group. We went from, I don't know, 25 members over in the uh, Bell Building in a small cadre of statisticians to, I think, 300, 300 colleagues within six months. It really turned things around. And for cardiology in general, I think that this mega trial, randomized trial in the U.S. run really became a model for, for everything we do and, and still leads today. They were looking for a fellow to do gusto, and all of us were like, you know, no way. They never get any credit for this. It's multi-center. You know, they want to appear long He said, no, I'm not touching that thing. They, they went around, couldn't find anybody, but there was, this, there was this cardiology fellow who had been chief resident at Denver, uh, Chris Granger. And so uh, Chris accepted this, and now Chris is the, uh, I think, probably the second most famous cardiologist at Duke. Um, I don't mean to uh, hurt him with feelings here, but <laughs> he's huge. So uh, for the fellows who may be listening, uh, you really got to just uh, put a positive foot forward and embrace what you're doing, and it's amazing what things can come to. So this was Gusto. So I talked about this, and what's my point? <laughs> so in 2000, things kind of changed. Um, the trials ended. We tested everything, right leg, left leg, um, you know, backwards, forwards, everything you could do in thrombolysis we'd already tested for acute cath. Um, and it got to the point where a cath lab, after hours, uh, Dr. Caleb said, it's better to give lytics. We're just so slow after hours, which is hard to believe. And then we had this cardiology fellow who was here for a year, paid by the Canadian government, named Matt Lotfi. And uh, Chris had this, uh, he was Chris's fellow, and I had this project with the Heart Association to look at resurrecting our clinical trials network. And Matt went out there into the field, and he told us it takes too long to activate the Duke cath lab. It takes three hours. And this is a terrible job. I can't do this. I go to person counter, they yell at me. This just doesn't work. We need to have a hotline, one number you call that activates the cath lab. This one idea of this fellow, I think, transformed acute cardiac care in, in the United States. That basically now everyone does this, and it was Matt's idea. And at the same time, I was uh, knee-deep in, in Medicare data, including the state data. And I was looking at uh, eligible elderly patients and reperfusion. And some hospitals treated nobody, zero. People came in with chest pain, were eligible for lytics or PCI, and got no treatment whatsoever. And with that, I actually noted this, and I got investigated by the Office of Inspector General, because apparently this data is, is private in terms of hospital information. You're not allowed to let it out. And so I was actually booted from any access ever again to the, uh, this, this database and from the Medical Review of North Carolina. And that's when I met across the hall with Chris Granger. One of the great things about this place is we're all so close together. And Chris bailed me out, Chris and Matt. So what's the concept between, about race? Back to Krzyzewski. A basketball team is like five fingers on your hand. If you can get them all together, you have a fist. And that's how I want you to play. And that's exactly what we're talking about with this, this race uh, concept. And it came from Duke Clinical Trials. When everyone knew what they were supposed to do, we had our protocols. We knew what we were testing. The cath lab was coming in. And we knew how to randomize patients. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Chris. I'll hook you up here. Great, thanks, Jamie. Um, so that's great, great um, historical uh, uh, perspective, and a lot of. It, I mean, it is remarkable thinking back uh, um, over the years. Here, my disclosures, um, and uh, and I'll hit on actually a few of these themes that. Uh, um, that Jamie um, hit on as well. So in terms of the evidence of, um, of, of what we are trying to do, improve the application of reperfusion therapy, we know that fibrinolytic therapy reduces death by about 23% from the fibrinolytic therapy um, trials. Um, from Gusto, um, we know that we can get another 14% or 
relative risk reduction, 1% absolute um, improvement in survival with more effective fibrinolytic therapy with accelerated TPA um, in this case. We know that if we give treatment more rapidly, we save more lives, especially in the first um, um, hour or so. And then we also know that primary PCI is better than fibrinolytic therapy. And actually, um, Carrie Lee's daughter, Jennifer, was the coordinator uh, on, the, uh, on the Gusto 2B trial, which in fact is the biggest trial that was part of, you know, Cindy Grimes gets all the credit. Um, but uh, um, again, Harry Phillips and, and Rob and Jennifer Lee and Bob was involved with this. A lot of people uh, um, helped out with this trial, which was a very important part of the evidence base for, uh, for establishing the role of primary PCI um, as the, uh, when it can be done quickly as the best possible um, reperfusion treatment. So huge amount of evidence, much of it from the DCRI about the benefits of uh, reperfusing patients with acute MI and, and saving lives. But then we also knew, and this came from a lot of different um, registries, um, including NARMI and, and, and uh, this data from GRACE, that a lot of patients weren't getting reperfusion therapy. Some of this is because Back when fibrinolytic therapy was the only option, there are a lot of patients who have contraindications who can't get it because they would have bleeding or, or bleeding stroke or other um, complications. Um, but uh, between NARMI and GRACE, um, somewhere between, somewhere around a quarter to a third of patients who looked like they should be getting it um, weren't getting it. And, and the higher risk patients were a particularly um, susceptible group to not receiving proven therapy. And also there were these huge delays that Jamie alluded to that Matt Lotfi picked up on that were also reflected in the national data that it was hours of time that it took between the time a patient presented and that they got um, um, primary angioplasty if they were transferred for it. And there were also fairly long delays for patients getting um, fibrinolytic therapy. So really what we were trying to do in the early days of RACEN was close that gap, was take the evidence and better apply it um, to save lives. And, and I, think it was, it may, I think it was Jamie's idea to come up with the uh, race car analogy with the, with the hope that here NASCAR was this uh, very popular sport, lots of money in it, and that this would be a great way to get funding for the project, to call it um, race and go to NASCAR. And I don't think we've gotten a penny from NASCAR in spite of <laughs> of our attempts, but nevertheless it worked because it's a little bit like Krzyzewski's um, basketball um, teamwork. It's also to do well in racing um, takes a lot of very good teamwork and we also had the time um, analogy metaphor that, uh, um, that seemed to work pretty well. So we had the pilot phase and then Bob Jones, when he was the governor of the American College of Cardiology in North Carolina and Joe Babb, who was the next governor, worked with us to identify opportunities to use the American College of Cardiology as a way to bring people together. Because part of the problem that we have in, in medicine is we have our fragmented system that's highly competitive and we tend not to work together very well. So a professional society then can really help. And you think DCRI would be viewed as a fairly um, uh, objective um, and, uh, entity, but in fact, um, you know, 12 miles or so down the road, it's not seen that way at all, nor is it seen that way in Raleigh, nor, so, so it turns out that it's very important. And then places like Charlotte, so we, we, we recruited um, Bill O'Neill to help with this uh, project, and Bill said, to help as an oversight person, and Bill said, uh, this is a great project, but you're never, and, you, and we, we, I wish you good luck, but you're never going to be successful in Charlotte. Too competitive. No way in the world would they ever work together. They've never even been in the same room together. Um, so, so, so that was our challenge, was, uh, uh, was to get people to work together. So, so we, uh, um, we then were able to, to get also, timing is so important in these things, and, and the timing was just right with Blue Cross Blue Shield. They made enormous amounts of profit. They were getting all kinds of criticism from the, uh, from the press. And so they had, to, they had to, to, to spend down some of their reserves and some of their profit in a way that, that looked like they were uh, doing something um, productive. And so they, uh, so they were looking for proposals. So we sent this proposal. I'll show you the, um, the proposal. And like within 24 hours, got a million dollars. It was actually, um, we were very lucky um, for that. So it doesn't happen very often now. So then we did the first race project. Um, we got uh, with Eric Peterson, 
um, got incorporated into the uh, um, uh, pharmaceutical roundtable grant to get additional um, funding from that, um, and then uh, and then did this ra recent race ER, and the next project is going into uh, um, cardiac arrest. So you heard about Matt Lotfi. Um, again, he was a uh, he was a very interesting guy, uh, but he was very good at connecting with emergency medicine and, uh, and EMS. And that was, uh, and, and as Jamie said, he was very important. This was our proposal. It was seven pages, um, double spaced, I think. And it was, uh, and, and this is the budget. This is the extent of the budget details. Actually, something that was very important, it turned out to be, we, we decided we didn't have enough money to do what we wanted to do with the million dollars. So, so driving down the road um, to our first meeting, I think we decided that, that we should get buy-in from the PCI centers to help fund these coordinators. And that turned out to be very important, not only because it gave us extra funding, but because it also got them to be invested in the project. So then they were really, uh, really at the table. So this was our challenge. U.S. healthcare is, is, is uh, characterized by fragmentation, and there's nowhere that's more true than in emergency medical services. It's really actually striking how little coordination there is. And so in North Carolina, which is fairly typical, we have 100 counties, 540 different agencies um, with, with, uh, with, with, with traditionally very different approaches and resources in each agency in each um, county. And then we have these 21 primary PCI centers, about 120 hospitals altogether. And so really our challenge was to integrate this because without integration, it would be impossible to provide um, effective care to any individual patient that had to go through these various um, um, components. So we did this in our first race program. We identified five regions. They, they, were, they corresponded to, to the counselors for the American College of Cardiology. Um, and, uh, um, and we put this um, group together of about two thirds of the hospitals in the state and uh, presented and published this uh, um, three years ago. Um, now we had uh, baseline and, and um, post-intervention data, and we had two goals, to increase the rate of reperfusion and increase the um, speed of reperfusion. And in terms of, uh, um, uh, of the times, we really reduced all the times um, modestly but substantially from the time a patient presented until they um, received either um, primary PCI, um, including patients who were transferred down from about 150 minutes down to 106 minutes in hospitals that routinely um, transferred, and then um, getting patients out of, of hospitals, which is a, still a huge challenge, is how do we um, get a patient um, who presents to a non-PCI hospital who's appropriate for transfer, how do we efficiently get them out of the hospital? Jeff Takeman actually has helped us recently in a um, simulation training program to work with hospitals to actually film a, um, a, 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 an actor coming in as a patient to see how their systems are working to get the patient transferred um, efficiently, including EMS and calls and the, the different um, hospital staffs. Probably the most important group of people working on our project, and I don't think probably, definitely the most important were these coordinators, because this is, this is really what it took. It took coordination and building the teams. So each of these five um, regions had then a um, one or two nurse coordinators whose job it was every day to get up and say, how can I get all these different EMS agencies and hospitals to effectively work together to implement standardized protocols based on the guidelines um, and to feed, to collect the data and feed the data back. Um, and so in race ER then, the, the, uh, the part of the project that we've just presented at the American Heart Association, we expanded it to include the entire state. And uh, um, Jamie went to the KB Reynolds Foundation and got a nice grant from them to, to fill out, especially in some of the poor counties around the state where they're are even fewer resources for EMS and even a bigger challenge in, uh, um, in providing the best care. So, um, so we really took the same model from, from the original race project and, uh, and, and applied that um, and, and tried to focus even more on EMS as, as understanding that that was a really important opportunity to have people call 911. Once 911 is called, to have the paramedics obtain a 12 lead EKG, interpret it, and activate the reperfusion process is a key uh, opportunity. 
So we had these 120 hospitals. We used um, Action Register to get with the guidelines, which um, NARMI had, um, and Crusade had, uh, had transferred um, into and, um, uh, and, and, and defined um, data definitions to focus on as our targets um, for, uh, for race ER. And then again, we had a pre and post data collection. Total of about 7,000 patients were included. And, uh, you know, the biggest challenge in, I think, in, in both um, developing STEMI systems, well, no, maybe not the biggest challenge, but one of the key challenges, and, and even more so in cardiac arrest care, is the data, is collecting and being able to analyze the data. So we're very fortunate to have um, um, ARG um, housed here, to have Eric and um, Beth and Barb and their team partnering um, on this to make the best use of the data. We're also very fortunate to be able to convince all PCI centers in North Carolina, the only state in the, in the U.S. where that happened, to do um, action registry, get with the guidelines. It was really, the first few were kind of tough, and then we got some momentum. And then the last few decided to do it because they didn't want to be left out. It's a good uh, motivator. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to that, yeah. So, um, uh, so this is some of the team then showed on the next couple of slides, including um, Jamie was uh, mentioning how Hussein has been uh, um, so important to this um, and, uh, and continues to be, even today, as we're trying to finalize the, uh, uh, the manuscript. Um, but, but we really appreciate um, um, Hussein's great work on this and support of this. Um, a lot of the activity comes from the primary um, PCI centers. Um, but, but a lot of people are involved in this type of a program, including um, EMS, um, hospital administration, um, these, uh, the nurse um, coordinators, cardiologists are key to have on board. Um, EMS um, state leadership has also been been really important, and, and then we kind of we put together really a a, a, um, um, a, a, a wide variety of funding sources to uh, um, to fund the the program first from Blue Cross Blue Shield and then subsequently from a, um, a variety of, of sources um, shown here. And we have a fairly standard then um, approach to the um, quality improvement of um, once, once we had the structure developed then establishing the primary PCI centers first uh, and then um, having each of them deputized to go out and, and assure that the EMS agencies and the feeding hospitals in there regions were, um, were incorporated and then also making sure that we had enough meetings to, uh, to exchange ideas and to have people recognize that they're part of a, of a statewide program with great stories. Every meeting we try to have patient stories, you know, compelling patient stories of patients' lives being saved. A lot of times people that, that even the nurses or the, or the cardiologists at these different centers knew to bring home the impact that this was making. Um, on the lives of, of, um, of their patients. And then we had an operations manual that Jamie really put together with help from everybody in the state to make sure that people were on board, taking the guidelines and try to simplify them as much as we could, unlike the guidelines which have hundreds of pages, like I think 250 pages, Bob, the last um, version, something like that, thousands of references. We tried to distill it down to the few things that you really have to do um, to uh, to make sure they could be done um, efficiently. Jonathan Cook, in the group, did the uh, the the um, Not manual, the right? manual, yeah, Jonathan Cook. Um, we love maps. Maps are so important for any kind of regional development. And um, so this is our current map of the of the state of North Carolina and hospitals defined with the triangles as the PCI centers. Um, the um, the, the yellow stars as hospitals that routinely transfer, the red stars as, um, uh, as hospitals that give fibrinolytic therapy as their primary approach, and then the blue is, is a mixed strategy. And you can see that, for example, in the east of the state, the poor areas of the state, there are lousy roads. Some of the ambulances still don't routinely be a, perform and interpret EKGs. Uh, there, there are, um, th there's a lot of difficulty in transferring patients efficiently. So they give fibrinolytic therapy as the, as the most common approach. And then in the, in the central area where, the, where we have good roads, 
um, transfer for primary PCI um, is what happens. And then in, in mountains, it's more of a mixed uh, model. So here were our 7,000 patients, um, about, well, 57% presented to the PCI center, and 43% were transferred. Now, we didn't actually collect data at the, at the non-PCI centers. This is a challenge because these are small hospitals that really don't have the resources to be going through charts and abstracting and collecting data. But we knew from our original project that about 95% of patients with STEMI get transferred to a PCI center in the state of North Carolina. So, um, so, so that's the approach that we took is we depended on the PCI center to collect the data um, for these patients who are, um, who are transferred. And you see that age is about 60 years, um, a fairly typical set of characteristics with the exception of shock being, being much higher than one would have expected. And we're still not sure whether this is some quirk now of the way we're collecting that data on ARG or, or uh, but it's anyway, it's a high rate of, of shock on, uh, um, on presentation and, um, and, and, and heart failure. So these were the overall data then on how reperfusion therapy is administered in North Carolina. Um, more and more patients are getting primary PCI now up to over 80%, 14% getting um, fibrolytic therapy. And then this number, I showed you that data from GRACE, 38% eligible patients not getting reperfusion therapy. NARMIA was 25. Um, it's been, you know, it's been at least 15 to 20 in almost all registries. And, and here it's 4%. We don't think this is really because there's such a big difference. It's probably partly that data is being collected in a different way and people are more sensitized to exclusions, partly based on the need to report to Medicare and other things. But we still think this is likely represents much better application of reperfusion therapy and certainly an improvement uh, over, um, over time, including from our first um, race experience. For patients who are being transferred, this is really interesting that there is this shift now. Again, more, not surprisingly, more patients being transferred for primary PCI and fewer patients getting lytics. But still, 31% of patients in North Carolina who present to a non-PCI center are getting fibrinolytic therapy. And I think that would surprise a lot of cardiologists who basically think fibrinolytic therapy is something that, that occurs like every once in a while in a VA or in a very rural environment, but is rarely given anymore. It's still given a lot. And I think probably appropriately, although we continue to look for opportunities to treat more patients with uh, primary PCI. And this is a fascinating observation that really s s is striking, I think, that, that, we, that we've traditionally thought that about half of patients with, with MI present by their own vehicle or so-called walk-ins, and about half come via EMS. And what we see is that's true, kind of, but it's, but it's highly dependent on the type of hospital. So now, Three quarters of patients at PCI centers come by EMS. Patients don't walk in with STEMI to PCI centers nearly as much, and exactly the opposite for non-PCI centers. So you can, you, can, you can see then that when you develop strategies for improving care, you need to understand that to develop the strategies. In the non-PCI center, you better be good with a walk-in, at, at identifying the, uh, the MI, and, and immediately activating the, the transfer process if you're a transfer center. Again, Jeff went through this on a, um, on a simulation um, recently, so he, he's, uh, um, he's experienced this. And this is, um, some, this is kind of a complicated slide, but just to make the point that there are different ways for a patient with, with an acute MI to present to the medical system. They can either go directly into a PCI center, call EMS, and then we start the clock at first medical contact when EMS gets to the patient, we start the clock for when we for quality improvement measures, or they could bypass um, a, uh, a a non PCI center, drive around it, or um, you know, or go to a at least go to a further PCI center than the nearest non PCI center, um, or they can be transferred through a non PCI center. So, and, and each of these has a different set of issues for how we how we address it to improve care. For patients presenting directly to PCI centers in North Carolina, this is also remarkable, I think, that, that now we're up to almost 90% of patients are getting pre-hospital EKGs. This was back in the late 1990s, the first NARMI reported, it was 7%. So from 10 years, 
And North Carolina, I think, is probably the state, I think this is higher than probably any other state in the country, that now we're really focused on this as, a, as being a very important way to rapidly identify and get the process started for reperfusion therapy. And then when we look at the um, at, at, at patients presenting directly to PCI centers, we see this, this modest improvement from the um, over the six uh, quarters of our um, program. Uh, but for, for one thing, you see that patients who come in via EMS from the door to device time is very rapid. Over 90% are within 90 minutes. Um, and then it's longer for patients who come in um, by walk-in, but still quite impressive uh, um, times. And, um, uh, and then this, the first medical contact device is something that we're still working hard on, and there's actually some controversy about how this should be accounted for when looking at performance. Um, partly because if you have, if you're at a center that has long, that has EMS using long transportation time, then first medical contact to device is going to be longer. And yet that may be the best approach. And for example, in, in Mission Lifeline, um, now to be recognized as a, as a, as a um, excellent hospital, you have to have 75% of the time first medical contact to device within 90 minutes. For example, at Duke, we're not doing that, even though I think we're doing a, a pretty good job with this, and it's partly because of these um, longer transport times. And that is just another way to, um, to, to cut the, uh, um, the data. How about for patients going to non-PCI centers? Here we see also, I think this is the best has ever been reported in a multi-center um, project like this, that we're down now to 39 minutes door in, door out for centers routinely transferring for PCI. That's getting to be pretty good uh, um, performance. And then this, these are the numbers for, um, for, for um, first door um, to device, and we're down from 107. You remember, this is 106 minutes in at the end of our first race project. But then we included a lot more. We doubled the number of PCI centers. So we diluted and, and, and included the, the entire state and all hospitals. So in, in a sense, we include, we've included a lot more um, hospitals which were not as proficient. And, and we see this improvement from 117 minutes down to 103 minutes. We think this is pretty good. They, we're not sure we can get a whole lot better than this for most hospitals in terms of first door um, to device for hospitals that are routinely transferring. Now, ones that are not routinely transferring, there there's still um, an opportunity to do better. And if you look at the interquartile range, still 25% of patients, even in hospitals routinely transferring, are longer than 127 minutes. So some of the outliers, I think, can be, uh, um, can be improved. Well, how about outcomes? So this is, uh, of course, everybody wants to know. So you've, you've improved the process, but really what we want to do is save more lives. Show us that you're saving more lives. This is a real challenge, and we've, we've, had, we've done a lot of work on this. Seth Glickman um, with, uh, um, with Eric and the um, Pharmaceutical Roundtable Grant has been working on this, trying to understand um, through all different kinds of analyses, can we define an impact on survival? And the answer is so far, this has been difficult to do. What we can show is that over time, mortality is decreasing. But it's decreasing in other states too. It's not just in North Carolina. And it's hard to show that our decrease is substantially greater than other states, but it's also so confounded. And for example, you see um, um, here that, that you, you saw that more patients with shock are coming into the system. And that may be partly due to the fact that we're getting them in faster by EMS activating faster. You see that for patients who don't have um, shock, for example, the mortality rates now are getting to be very low. Um, but this is a, uh, it, it's an ongoing challenge to define what is the, uh, the impact that we're having. Here's from the first race project to, the, um, to uh, race ER. Um, mortality is, is decreasing, but, it, but again, it's decreasing um, elsewhere as well. This is a slide that Jamie and Hussein put together. It's a little bit complicated, but I think there's three points from the, and this. We haven't shown this slide uh, at, at any of the other um, presentations, uh, but this is divided. This looks at three things. It looks at the, at the groups of patients according to what was the drive time for transfer patients from the non-PCI to the PCI hospital, the short drive time, the medium, and the long. And then it looks at, at whether the patients came by ground or by air. And then it looks at whether they're treated with fibrinolytic therapy or primary PCI. And we think what this is telling us is 
that, that it's almost always faster to use ground than air in North Carolina for transportation. Um, that patients who have shorter drive times um, um, have, and, and therefore faster first um, door to, to device times, have lower mortality than, than longer times, not surprisingly. But this is really interesting, and this is kind of totally hypothesis generating, but it's consistent, I think, with what we believe. And that is that primary PCI, transfer for primary PCI has lower mortality as long as the transportation time and the first door to device time is, is, is not prolonged. But once you get into the very prolonged times, then, then, uh, then fibrinolytic therapy actually numerically is better. This is consistent with the idea that, with the guidelines, that, that if you have very long um, transportation times, that generally if a patient's eligible, fibrinolytic therapy may be the, uh, um, the best treatment. Is that a fair explanation, Jamie? Um, so we have a lot of limitations the way we do in any of these projects. Um, we, um, um, we have, you know, that we have the, the issues with ARG, although I think ARG is pretty comprehensively um, applied in North Carolina. Um, we don't really have a good control group, and, uh, and, and we have challenges in looking at the, uh, the important outcomes. So, so our summary then from, uh, um, from race ER is this very low proportion of eligible patients not treated major shifts in the way care is being delivered. And we think this is good, that now patients are being taken by EM, diagnosed by EMS and taken to PCI centers um, preferentially. Um, there, um, uh, th there were um, substantial improvements in the times to treatment, although still there are some opportunities to, um, to treat patients more rapidly. Um, and, and we think this supports the idea that this type of a project is, uh, um, is worthwhile and important. And in fact, now it's strongly supported in the guidelines. Um, the guidelines now have a class one recommendation for developing regional systems of care for acute MI. And it's been endorsed by Mission Lifeline, which is this fairly ambitious American Heart Association program that Jamie and Eric and um, Matt Rowe and um, Bob was part of the uh, original um, leadership group for it. Um, is working on, and it's, um, I think it is making a real impact using the types of approaches that we've used in North Carolina and several other regions have used, but no other entire state has used to, um, um, to improve uh, acute MI care uh, um, in the U.S. Now let me switch gears for about five minutes to, uh, to, the, to kind of a, one of our next challenges, and that is in um, cardiac arrest, and there's a big overlap in treating patients with cardiac arrest and ST elevation MI. So this was a patient who I'm following in the clinic, 57-year-old man, he arrested at his home. His son heard him fall over in the kitchen, went running in, saw him collapse, called 911 and started CPR, which is lucky. That happens 15% of the time in North Carolina that the bystanders start CPR. So there's a big opportunity already for Improvement. EMS gets there about 10 minutes later. That's good. That's good response time. Was cardioverted a bunch of times. Um, um, intubated. Um, and, and a 12 ED EKT was obtained, and he had an inferior MI. So he was taken from Alamance County um, across the county line past Alamance Regional Medical Center to do 32-minute transport time. He was in cardiogenic shock in a coma. He was taken to the cath lab. He had door to balloon time 46 minutes, first EKG to balloon time 91 minutes, and was cooled and had a balloon pump put in. Um, and, uh, and here's the map. And actually, John Vivali um, uh, uh, put this together as, a, as one of these clinical case series that's in press in circulation, including this map, um, which we may get in a little trouble with from... Uh, um, Greensboro, because I think the patient was closer to Moses Cone, actually, from looking at this map. So here's the patient's home. And EMS drives down this road, and, and then here's Alamance Regional Medical Center. So talk about driving by. Uh, I mean, they went right past the door. They, they like, uh, and, and then they come down um, 85 um, to, uh, um, to Duke. So this is a nice example of... Um, of, of, of actually going right by a, a non-PCI hospital. And I'm, I'm reasonably convinced that if this patient had stopped in at Alamance that he would have been dead or um, at least disabled. I mean, I think there's very high probability of that given his um, 
um, his problems. He had a proximal occluded RCA. He had a right ventricular infarction physiology. Um, had um, bare metal stents placed and good um, reestablishment of flow. He had right ventricular dysfunction, but also some left ventricular dysfunction associated with his arrest acutely. He rested several more times in the cath lab. I forget who did his case. Uh, you probably wouldn't remember if it was you, but anyway, um, uh, a few days uh, a few days later, uh, he completely recovered, including with warming after being cooled to 33 degrees Celsius with this um, um, cooling vest. Um, he completely recovered his uh, neurologic function. Here he is. He went home on day eight. And here he is a few weeks ago in my clinic. And he says he literally feels better than in years. He feels better now because he's back. He's in rehab. Um, he's to exercise regularly. He feels better now than he did for years before his MI which I think is a real testament. The shock that gave you <laughs> yeah, yeah, several. He was shocked like six or seven times. There are data that are reasonably good for the benefits of this cooling of therapeutic hypothermia for patients who have cardiac arrest. This comes from two trials. One of them really wasn't randomized, but one, one um, um, was um, an, an Austrian trial, both published in, in New England Journal um, back in 2002 showing um, that one can improve for patients who have ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest, can improve the good outcome, the leaving the hospital um, with, with, uh, with neurologically intact from about 40% up to about um, over half um, um, of patients. And uh, Graham Nickel, who's out in Seattle, and I think also on this uh, particular report, Eric Peterson, um, Eric Osman were also co-authors on this, have put together the, a, a fairly compelling case that for cardiac arrest, regional systems of care are also something that's really um, warranted and could substantially um, improve outcome and survival. And this comes partly from this type of data, from these data showing regional heterogeneity. So if you have a ventricular fibrillation arrest in Seattle, 40% of the time you're going to survive and have a good outcome. But if it happens in Alabama, or I dare say, North Carolina, Jamie, uh, you think we're 5%? Um, you're going to have a much worse um, outcome. And uh, so the question is, can we be more like Seattle in the rest of the country um, and, uh, um, and develop systems? And there have been some nice reports, including summarized in that manuscript, that, um, that show that, that, that systems that take a multifaceted approach to improving care of these patients, it includes pre-hospital, bystander CPR, um, paramedic response, hospital response, intensive care unit, use of implantable defibrillators, that we can really improve outcome um, in this population. So this has led to the Medtronic Foundation identifying this as an important opportunity. So they put a lot of money into this heart rescue program. There are four states. Jamie has led our um, um, efforts on this. Um, we're hoping with Mike Redden's help in the next um, several days. Jamie, before? Oh, he's on it. Christmas that we'll have the uh, grant uh, uh, um, executed. Uh, but this is, a, th this is a bold, so there are four states, um, uh, Washington, Arizona, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. And the goal is to improve survival by 50% for one of the top causes of death. So it's an ambitious, you, know, you might say it's kind of a crazy goal, but it's actually probably possible. And the reason is because we're so pitiful right now. That, that we couldn't reduce mortality by 50%, but improving survival by 50% may be possible. One of our biggest challenges is we don't know what the survival is right now because nobody's collect, because it's very complicated to collect this data because a lot of this happens in EMS. And EMS doesn't have very many resources and is not very able or and doesn't have the tools to collect data. So that's another thing that we're working on with Greg Mears and... Um, others um, who, are, who are developing um, data um, systems in, in EMS. But it has these several major um, areas of focus, the community interventions, EMS, um, and, uh, and hospital. Um, and these are some of the needs uh, to develop a comprehensive program because we really need to look at all possible contributing factors that could improve outcome. We've got to develop the data collection and capture plan, and this is a huge challenge, and Jamie and others are spending a lot of time on this now. We're looking, working with um, um, 
um, Marie Lynn Miranda looking at the um, geospatial mapping. Can we identify, uh, for example, starting in Durham County, where are these arrests occurring, at what time, and how does the location of where the arrest occurred relate to the response? Like, are there some areas where bystander CPR is never given in some neighborhoods where we need to go and target those neighborhoods for training? Um, where dispatch times take forever, you can imagine in rural settings that's going to be the case, but are there places where, where EMS could be better stationed to respond? Um, are there times of day when things are not happening um, as quickly? Those, those kinds of, uh, of, of questions that, uh, um, that the School of Environment um, group is so um, well positioned to help deal with. Community engagement. Um, improving bystander CPR. It, some places are claiming 80% bystander CPR. We're 15% in Durham County. And Jamie, you think that's similar to North Carolina in general? Um, how, can we, um, how can we improve that? So, you know, Lloyd Michener and his group are doing all kinds of interesting things in Durham. So we're engaging them to, uh, um, to, to train um, CPR uh, more effectively. Um, also, what, what EMS does, if you call 911 and say you're with somebody who had a cardiac arrest, they actually try to instruct you on the telephone how to do CPR. And, and we don't know how effective that is. It's never really been studied. So one of the things that we want to do in this program is not only do things, but because we have 100 counties and, um, and, and all this heterogeneity in North Carolina, we'd like to actually study like well, different interventions, ideally randomly assign different communities to different interventions to see like how do we do this, uh, uh, how do we do this better. Therapeutic hypothermia, um, health economics, certainly we've begun discussions with Jillian about how could we determine, is this something that, uh, um, that's, that's cost effective, that's worth, that's worth the effort uh, um, to, to do this. Um, and then these are, these are uh, just some additional um, 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 next steps. Um, a, lot of a lot of work going on too with our database, which has been a nice database on, uh, on better understanding opportunities to improve um, what we're doing based on the, uh, the race data. Uh, and I'll just finish up by acknowledging um, a lot of work from a lot of people um, um, who have be either been associated with or at the, uh, um, the DCRI, um, including uh, Raj, who helped with our, led our original design manuscript, and um, Matt, who's, um, um, who's doing a lot of work with this, Eric's team, um, um, we mentioned Hussein. Dave Rendell has been our project leader. Seth Glickman, who's worked closely with Eric, uh, he's a great uh, double agent. He's at UNC, but also still working with, uh, with DCRI as an emergency uh, um, medicine researcher. And then uh, um, a variety of other people, including people who are now um, becoming engaged for some of the, uh, the, the cardiac arrest work. So thanks for your attention. I can turn it over to Jamie to close with a couple of slides. I think there's a couple more slides in here. Yeah. So Dr. Shevsky, basketball was not my main sport in grade school, or even the first year of high school. Pretty surprising. But actually, this is really what it's all about. We hear this comment all the time in our meetings. Me, teamwork is the beauty of our sport. You have five actually in one, and you become selfless. And I can say again and again, we go to these meetings, and the nurses stand up and say, Any patients see beauty, everything just works really well. And the patients themselves are just absolutely grateful. Often, they're treated, uh, Dr. Harrington, the older spouse, is actually kind of parking spot, and I do that with that guy. Um, and it really you can do work together. Selfless training is probably the best thing that DCR is all about. We were saying we thought because of his language, they kicked him out of <laughs> yeah, Well, well done. Uh, questions and comments? Mr. Gary, that was terrific, and I do agree with you. This is one of the, uh, the best things that, uh, that DCI has underway. It's incredibly important, and the impact locally is 
clearly felt around the country, as you, I mean, everybody knows about uh, race who is interested in establishing statewide projects. One, one of the things I learned over the last few years when one of my uh, twin daughters was working in the cath lab, in fact, you should change that to ICC attendings, fellows, and staff, yeah, yeah. because the, uh, it's really the staff that's unbelievable at this in terms of uh, how frequently they're on call, et cetera. I mean, you know, the attendings, are, for the most part, are on call once or twice a month. The staff's on call once or twice a week. And that gets to my question, and I, you and I have had this discussion before. The false calls, you know, one of the reasons that this works is that we no longer make people jump through a whole series of hoops to come to the hospital, uh, to get the team to come to the hospital. What's an acceptable level of the false calls are you monitoring that? You know, the impression is is that overall, it's not bad, except for one place, the Duke Emergency Room, where it's uh, where it seems to be terrible. Uh, and I don't know if that's perception or reality. And what's acceptable? How are you studying this? And is it felt to be a big deal? Yeah. So the good news is, I think I think this, the manuscript on this from this from the race uh, group, largely the race coordinators and Lee Garvey um, helping to lead this, I think is in press now, in circulation. Well, but he said it anyway. It's oh, close, uh, close. We think it's out to the uh, statistical reviewer. Um, but J Jamie, maybe you you could so describe. So the numbers are uh, for paramedic activation of the lab for all the calls across 14 hospitals and I see how many thousand activations. Uh, one out of five times that cath is canceled. The other four or five times it goes to the lab. Uh, for emergency physicians... And, and did you have the data when they get to the lab? How many? I get that okay. too. For emergency <laughs> physicians activating the lab, and somehow Duke must have left his average job, it's uh, one in 20 times do not go to the lab. Now, gee, that must be preposterous. Because it seems like it's one and two. Uh, uh, once you get to the lab, uh, first shown in Minnesota and now in North Carolina, 90% uh, of patients will have a closed artery. And the other 10% will be things uh, maybe from spasm, maybe a thrombus, maybe a severe pain, just a cath anyway. So on average, it looks pretty good. Uh, but there are opportunities, and there's also the way these data go, they give you a lot of variation. What I do, I urge my colleagues to do is if, if you're getting activated and don't think it's right or your daughter's thinking it's getting called in here. Uh, but she was getting paid, so I was delighted. <laughs> <laughs> the same, I go right back to sleep. My wife does. She's up all night. I get three pages of every one of these. And, um, is I would urge you to go down to the ER and, and to their education conferences or go out to the EMS stations. And that's what we did. We had three homeless shelter early recalls come in one time in the weekend. And so the next week we were down to EMS station in Durham educating about smiley faces. Good stuff, and frowning faces. But, you know, <laughs> so if, if, you know, if, if the rates are too high, um, that just points to a great opportunity to educate. I think at Duke, the issue is that um, cardiology, again, has been such a leader in the hospital that the smartest person, when, when Dr. Jones is doing rounds in the hospital, is the CTU fellow. They have a ton of experience. They're here. Maybe not hospital taking over a bit, but pretty much the CTU fellow is, is the person in the hospital. And there's a very low threshold to ask them whether it's the ER, whether it's the ICUs, wherever, ask a CCU fellow. I think traditional talk to CCU fellow is so embedded. False call rate in our ER is not hard to stick with. I just have to say it was a fantastic presentation. Um, having practiced in Murphy, North Carolina, which is, you know, North Carolina is from Maneo to Murphy, um, it's really gratifying to see you take on the whole state. But um, I'm actually curious what happened in those areas that did have long transfer times, whether there was any change in the practice. So Murphy is two and a half hours from Asheville, even though it's in the western part of the state. And frequently a lot of the transfer pattern is to Atlanta to Emory, and I don't know if you lost capture of the border counties because, yeah. and a lot of the people in the very western tip go to Chattanooga. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just wondered if you know whether, uh, if you have, if they were participating, at, not specifically Murphy, but those western counties, Silva, uh, Robbinsville, the places that were, you know, more than two hours away, did they just keep giving thrombolytic therapy? Did they transfer? Do you know anything about them? I'm just curious. So anecdotally, uh, there's now a program in South Carolina, there's a program in Virginia, there's a program in Tennessee. And for instance, I was just in a meeting uh, with people from Cherokee, 
County, which is our, our left flank here. That's Murphy. Um, Murphy, and they actually go over to the hospital in Tennessee. Um, they don't go to Atlanta because no Atlanta hospital accepts them. Oh. Um, and so now, at least, they can't get this activation lab, so they're going to Tennessee every time. So uh, what's be this has become a standard of care, though, where we, we expect you to take our patients. Um, but it's a key. We lose it's them, though, in our system. It's, it's, it's kind of a next step, but we, as Jamie said, we are making progress now, the, uh, the cross-state lines. We've, we've, we've accomplished a lot of the cross-county lines. The cross-state is even, is even more of an issue. I was up um, north of um, Winston-Salem, well, with Jeff Takeman, and there, there they have, a, they have a, a, um, a couple of hospitals that are just north of the uh, Virginia border where EMS has to come, and then, and then they have to actually shift into a North Carolina ambulance at the border or at the first hospital because they can't, you know, legislatively, they can't go all the way, although they're working on, on, on trying to overcome some of those kind of artificial barriers. And EMTC, which is cardiovascular in Virginia, when they cross that line, they're no longer <coughs> certified in North Carolina to take care of so many patients. And this is points to national leadership where there is, this is run out of the Highway Transportation Safety Administration, NHTSA, and they really are nuts about motor vehicle accidents and don't have to know a thing about acute uh, cardiac emergencies. And we really need national standards here. And it's things like mission life on the guidelines or things you do that are going to drive this nationally. Mm -hmm. Are those uh, places that are long distance of, uh, distances away still using thrombolytic therapy across the board? We're almost having a, a redux back to Gusto and Tammy. <laughs> our, our transfer times are so long despite all this effort, uh, and now the guidelines, particularly first medical contact, they say within 90 minutes. Our most recent meetings, everyone's asking, should we just start getting lytics again and not do the transfer? The challenge with lytics are people are afraid of them. Emergency physicians are, are terrified to give them because of that one in, or two in 100 head bleed when it happens is devastating. We, those of us who are older are taking care of these patients. Um, and it's very hard to educate them. Uh, but it's now, it's funny how things kind of come around here. I'm here with Dr. Dr. Lee uh, in the Gusto days, and the lytics are, are becoming, again, reborn in 2010. Uh, thank you.